I think like everyone else on the planet, I felt like the rug was ripped from under my feet. I felt like I was in a state of like free fall almost. Like it was just, um, it was really difficult. You know, it's all subjective. You, you can only deal with your own reality. Um, and mine was, <laughs> it felt like it was falling apart. Army Hammer brings a big vibe. From his breakout role as both Winklevoss's twins in David Fincher's The Social Network, to his captivatingly seductive performance in Call Me By Your Name, alongside some young whippersnapper called Timothy Chalamet, Army is that very rare creature, a leading man with a soul. This month, he can be seen in Ben Wheatley's, ben Wheatley's chilling adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca for Netflix with Lily James and Kirsten St Scott Thomas. Welcome to GQ Heroes, my friend, my mentor, my role model, my everything, Mr. Army Hammer. How are you? Jonathan, I gotta say, if I'm your hero and role model and mentor, I'm very concerned about the direction your life is gonna turn. <laughs> very concerned. <laughs> well, let's not focus on me for once <laughs> and focus Fair on enough. you. Fair enough. Um, first off, let's start with a quote. Ooh, 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 king shit. Aubergine, 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 red heart, red heart, red heart, red heart, fire, 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 fire. Talk you me, forgot talk the splooshes. And the splooshes. You, you forgot the splooshes after the eggplants. <laughs> uh, oh God, man, fucking A. Talk to uh, me. So this is what happens when, this is what happens when you Instagram when slightly uh, tipsy. Things just seem like a really good idea. And you know what? In hindsight, it's a pretty good idea, but it definitely has its downsides. Um, the, the main drawback here is that most people didn't understand that I was actually being facetious. I was, I was actually trying to poke fun at how ridiculous everyone on the internet sounds these days. With their like, ooh, I stand that, king shit, ooh, whatever, whatever. You know, like, it's, 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 it, people on the internet, they're using words that are English, but they're using them in like a combination that just completely perplexes me. So I was like, you know what, like, Timmy posted a thirst trap selfie, so I was like, ooh, king shit, you know. Uh, but I don't think anyone got the joke. I think everyone thought that I was honestly making like some sort of like clandestine cloak and dagger reference to Call Me By Your Name 2 or something like that. They're like, see, the movie's coming now. It's ready. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I've right. we've spoken before about the anticipation around that, around that film. That's kind of a blessing yep. and a curse, right? The, the, the kind of unicorn yeah, and beauty I mean, of the first film and now the sort of yeah. coiled up anticipation for something which has hardly yet begun, I guess, for you, the sequel. I think Buddha said something very perfectly about this. Almost, it's like, it's like almost like he was a Call Me By Your Name fan. I'm sure he would have been. Um, <laughs> but he said uh, that expectations are the root of all suffering. And it's like, Look, man, we made this film, we had no expectations for it, and it turned into this beautiful thing that touched so many people and resonated with so many people. But now everyone is like, make the second one, and it's like, I don't know, man, I don't know, we'll see. I want an exclusive, though, will Peaches feature? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, peaches are now a part of my everyday life. I understand. <laughs> In all serious note, uh, you know, your relationship with Timothy is, it is a beautiful thing. Um, uh, and going back to, I guess, the idea of, of role models and mentorship, he does, you know, he has lent on you somewhat, both through the filming of that, uh, of that, of that film, and also in your friendship afterwards, you know. And I guess what I wanted to ask, that is a, a rare thing, that kind of relationship, and it must be, it must be a special thing, right? Yeah, it's nice. I mean, that's, that's one of the great things about this business is um, you get to go to different places and meet different people and interact with people all the time. And every now and then you meet someone or you interact with someone where you kind of go, you're not just a work friend, you're, you're, you're a real friend. And I like that. And, um, and you know, fortunately, I, I, fortunately for Timmy, I, I had some years on him. You know, I got some years and I got some city miles on me. So he was younger and, and you know, I mean, it was, really, it was really interesting to watch him go through the process of, of the success of Call Me By Your Name. And, and have to really kind of go through trial by fire and learn what this whole new world is about. He basically came from, you know, NYU theater school to call me by your name uh, with not much else in between. I mean, a few, a few smaller things in between, but nothing that sort of garnered that kind of success or, or attention. 
And watching him deal with it has been really impressive because in a lot of ways he's dealt with it better than I think I would have been able to at, at you know, 22 or 23 or however old he was when it happened. I mean, he dealt with it in a lot of ways better than I think I would have now. But in some ways, were you, you know, thrust into the limelight as he was and you seeing him go through that, were you worried in any way for him? Uh, or, or is he just someone with a great head on his shoulders so he's going to get through it no matter what? No, I wasn't really worried. I mean, he's got a great safety net of people around him. He's got great friends. Uh, he's, he's smart. I mean, he's a very, very smart young man. You do worry about anyone who has to go through that sort of level of attention and scrutiny because it's really intense. It's really hard. Most people don't realize that if you just turn off your phone, it goes away completely and it doesn't actually deserve any emotional real estate in your life. But that's a really hard lesson to learn, especially when it's new for someone and it seems exciting. I mean, it is a very sort of visceral thing to have that many people all of a sudden vying for your attention or, or wanting to tell you that they love you. And it, it's strange. Like watching what Timmy went through, I, I, I don't think I would wish that on anyone. I mean, it was really intense. You know, the guy can't even go stay at a hotel without, you know, 200 young girls or guys like waiting in front of the hotel for him, just trying to like get a peek at him trying to pull his hair out, trying to do whatever, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's intense, it's intense, but I think he's dealt with it with, you know, with a plum. Yeah, I agree. Um, talking about, I guess, social media for a second, it, it, you know, is our relationship with those platforms a good thing? Is it a healthy thing? Uh, what's your relationship like with, you know, you're on social, what's, what's your relationship like now with it? I think it's like wine, right? I think, I think wine is an intoxicant, much like social media is for a lot of people. And if you, drink wine responsibly, you can have a wonderful relationship with wine, you can try different types of wines, you can even get a little loose on wine and have a good time. But I mean, if you go like full Bukowski, and you're just like a wino on that stuff, <laughs> it, it, it'll eat you alive. I mean, it's, it's, it, is, it is not meant to edify the human spirit. There's no one really who gets a lot of good from it. Um, and the people who think that they're getting good are really getting something fake. They're getting a facade. Um, what happens on social media is not representative of the real world in any stretch of the imagination. I mean, you see these pictures of people where it looks like they're happy and partying and, you know, I'm in the beach on this picture, then I'm in Greece in this picture, then I'm over here in that picture, then I'm over here. And you think, oh my God, this person's life is truly glamorous. But, you know, I mean, I have so many things I want to say. Um, <laughs> social media is very dangerous. The same way that alcohol can be very dangerous when used responsibly and when you keep a sort of like healthy limit between you and that thing and don't let it consume your life, then I think it is possible to enjoy it responsibly. But, but I think that's a very slippery slope. Talking about enjoying responsibly, I think is that the perfect cue to make a martini? What isn't the perfect <laughs> cue to make a martini? I, you know, Mr. I've Jonathan. got kit here. I have kit. Oh, what, do you? What kind of kit do you have? I've got a, can you see that? I have a shaker. I never, I never leave home without a full martini set with me, <laughs> especially, especially at 10 o'clock in the morning. Absolutely, right? Okay. So this is your second today, right? Are we making martinis? Yeah, let's do it. Are we making martinis? We're going to. Okay. okay, I want to know, how do you prefer your martini? And then, uh, oh, should we do this? Should you make your martini and I'll make mine, and then we each take a sip of our own and declare ourselves the victor? How, how does this work best? Uh, well, I'm going to take my lead from you. Because I know you know martinis okay. because, you know, we have that story know. that we can't talk about. And I know that, and I know that you know martinis. <laughs> uh, all right. So you're going to start with your martini shaker. It's Is here. it nice and clean? It should be very clean. Clean? Okay, good. Fill it liberally with ice. Whoa, 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 oh, whoa, 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 okay, whoa. Wait. slow down. We're not, we're, not, <laughs> we're not even at the vodka yet. We're not even at the vodka yet. Okay, Actually, ice, you know what? Ice. We're going to take it one step back. First, you're going to get your martini glass. Oh, wait. Okay. And now my martini glass has ice in it glass? already because it's been chilling. Yeah, you see? Well, you beat you me see? to the first step. You see? All right. I'm ahead already. Okay. Mine now has ice in it. The reason you put ice in your martini glass is because if you get a martini so deliciously and unctuously cold and then put it in a warm glass, you've just wasted all of that time that you spent stirring it. And yes, I said stirring it, not shaking it. Wow. We're not okay. Philistines here. We do not shake our martinis. Don't you know, no James Bond no, style no, no, martinis no, no. here. By the way, he's great, he's great, but he drinks his martinis like someone I do not want to drink. My martini's like, okay, so my glass is now chilling. You want to put that down and you want to okay. let it get cold. It's going to get nice and cold. Okay. Then you're going to take your martini shaker. And you are going to... I'm icing, I'm putting ice liberally, in. Liberally fill it with ice. 
Okay. I don't know how much ice you have, but like I, mine is about two thirds full of ice. All right. I need more. Here I go. Next. Done. You're gonna take your vodka. Am I allowed to show the label? Of the oh, vodka? I'm on gin. Okay. So you're gonna. You're on gin. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I'm not having fun. This is not my party anymore. Okay, you can do gin. You do gin. You okay, do gin. gin. We know how you get on vodka. Okay. <laughs> so, this this is going to look like too much. Put put that jigger down. Put it down. Put what? It down. No jigger. You don't need that. No jigger. I got no, the jigger put specially. Put it down. Okay, fine. Put it down. You don't need it. All right, fine. How Come do we on. measure quantities, okay, though? So, <laughs> you just you just keep going. Yeah. You just like it's okay. Not about I'm gonna quantity. stop when you stop. It's about quality. I'm gonna stop when you stop. Okay, that's good. It's in. The gin is in. Now, oh, now if you listen carefully, let me see if I can get this. Hear it shaking around in there. Got that? There's my mic. Oh, I mean that, that's that's a seductive sound. A dangerous sound though. Okay, now, now you want to put this down, and let it continue to cool. Okay. <laughs> What time? What, see, it's like six o'clock over hey, there, isn't it? You're, it's, you're it's, it is martini time. It's martini o'clock for both by of the us. Way, every time is martini time if you're trying hard enough. Uh, <laughs> this, it's, by the way, I would just like to show, I was supposed to be there for this and drinking martinis with you at six o'clock in the afternoon. I know. It's now 10 o'clock in the morning here in LA and I'm going <laughs> to drink a martini with you and God knows what this is going to do to the rest of my day. Uh, okay, so. What next? I don't have cocktail onions, those little white onions. Uh, that is what I prefer in a martini. I love it. It's it makes your martini a Gibson. That's a it. Gibson martini should be vodka, no vermouth, and cocktail onions. We don't have that, but we have a we have a lemon. So you want to cut? I have no lemon. What, is, what you got? I've got vermouth. You have no lemon. Okay, what have you got? You have vermouth. Yeah. Okay. Then here's what you're going to want to do with your vermouth. You're going to want to take. The bottle of your vermouth, yeah, right, and you're going to want to slowly <laughs> pass it around the outside <laughs> of your shaker. What's this going to do to me? I'm in there church, you, you know that. And then you're gonna, and then you're gonna, and then you're gonna throw your vermouth away, right? <laughs> because no one should put vermouth in martinis. <laughs> Actually, Excellent. you know, with okay. a gin martini, with a gin, I, I take it back. I take it back. With vodka, you should not put vermouth. With gin, put Please. a little splash of vermouth. Just something. You want to get a little something just to dilute it yeah. a tiny bit. <laughs> What, you don't like drinking pure gin? I thought you were a professional. <laughs> Only on Sundays. Yeah, that, that should be good. How okay. dry do you like it? I like it pretty dry. I gave a generous splash. Okay. Okay, okay. Now, you don't want to shake it. Because oh. what will happen when you shake it is you'll end up breaking up the ice. And the ice will form into smaller crystals. And those smaller crystals will melt faster. So all you're doing essentially is, yes, you're chilling it, but you're also diluting it, as you said. So maybe you might want to shake it a little bit. <laughs> You know me too well. Yeah, let's shake it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you shake, shake, shake. Or you can stir if you have one of those long, twisty spoons. I don't have one of those. No stirs. It's good. We'll give it so a little caress. I'll give it a caress. Oh, well, since you don't have a lemon, I do. I am going to cut myself. Now, what is this? Is this a, a as we're doing this, is this a cocktail, a signature cocktail of yours? Do you, are you a, a chap that arrives home and after a long days shooting Rebecca or whatever it was and make yourself a, a signature cocktail, what will you make, Army? Oof, you know, it really depends on the mood. Uh, martinis are always great if I'm having like people for dinner or if I'm doing something like that. Uh, if I'm just sitting by myself and I've got an open bottle of wine, I'll pour a glass of wine, I'll have a beer, but uh, maybe, maybe like a, a scotch or something like that. Nice. Basically, I'm an alcoholic right. and I'll just drink whatever <laughs> I have available. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, okay, so, so I've made a lemon twist. I've nice. made a lemon twist. Now, my glass should be, I don't know if you can see. See how it's starting to get You've a little frosty in there? You've got a nicer glass than I have. That's more refined. Mine's yeah, but yours is a more proper martini-shaped glass. See how it's getting just a little bit frosty, frosty in there? <laughs> a little frosty glass? Okay, so take your ice, dump it out. Ditch it. Give it okay, a shake. It. Give it a shake. King shit. All right. Kink shit, exactly. You don't want any extra water in there because it will continue to dilute. Okay, see how frosty my glass looks? Look yeah. how beautiful that oh, is. Oh, I've got some frost. Now, I've got a tiny bit of frost. There you go. Now, right. I'm going to twist up my lemon rind just the tiniest bit. I can't do any of that. And, and go I'm like this observe. and rub it around the glass. Oh, look at that. Look at the way in. you did that. I'm turned on. Yep, that's how you get the essence. Now, <laughs> when can I have a drink? Are you ready? Okay, we're doing it. 
Wait, do we not use Ooh, the other? Look oh, at that. Ooh, look, look at, at that. the syrupy, oh, sweet thickness. Oh, nice. Oh, oh, a bit of ice went in mine. Ooh. Oh, you got to have the thing on the top. Where's your? I've ditched it. Do you have one of these? Yeah, I didn't. Oh, have, yeah. I haven't got one of those either. I'm not tooled up. Oh, you're playing fast. You're playing fast, fast and, and loose, John. Okay, I like it. Okay, there we go. All right. Here we are. Well, well cheers. Cheers. Very good. It, it's gin. Am I drinking this at 10 o'clock in the yes, morning? Yes, you are. <laughs> All right. You can sip it. That, make, that makes me a GQ kind of man. I guess it. Woo, woo. Okay. Well, that is delicious. How's yours? Ooh. Nice. Well, I should have another sip just to. Is, make <laughs> is Evelyn your, your, your uh, long suffering mm. publicist in the background with a fire extinguisher? No, no, she knew better than to come to this one. And you nailed it on long suffering. I feel so badly for that woman, the shit she has to deal with. <laughs> okay, that's good. Now, by the way, I'm supposed to go to the gym after this. I just no. want to say, this is 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to the gym after this, and I'm going to finish this martini because it's in front of me. <laughs> it will fire you up. Now, we've got, we've got you, we've got, the, we've got the martini, but we haven't got the handlebar moustache. Where is it? I know, I know. Uh, I'm working on it. Uh, it's, it's coming back. It will be back. I, I, will, I will end up with some sort of ridiculous facial hair by the end of the year. Do you I miss it? it? Do you miss the moustache a little bit? You know what? I do. I do. Like, it was... It, first of all, it feels like it's part of you, right? Because, I mean, essentially it is. It's an extension of your body. So when you cut it off, you're like, something feels like it's missing. It's like, it's like I feel like, I, you know, like those phantom limb sensations. I feel like my mustache is cold somewhere. Like it's fallen off of my face, like a like a World War One veteran with like a missing arm. <laughs> are you, I feel like sometimes you're sending subliminal me messages out though with with the length of your facial hair. I don't know. I don't know what message you're sending, but I feel like you're you're calling to someone. Maybe me. Yeah, you know what? It's like it's like the Animal Kingdom. You know, where like everything an animal does means something, and it's like, <laughs> are they trying to establish dominance? Are they trying to look for a mate? Are they trying to this or that? Who knows, man? Who knows? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you spent, uh, when we last spoke, in fact, you were uh, just outside of L.A., well, a fair, a fair distance outside of L.A., near Joshua Tree, smashing mm. stuff up with a sledgehammer. How, how yes. did that feel? How's it gone? How is the motel? Is it renovated? Can you see the smile on my face talking about <laughs> smashing shit with a sledgehammer? It's like, that, that's my happy place. Like, if I can't be on set, I'd rather be destroying something with a sledgehammer. Although, technically, I was using what's called a splitting maul, which is even better. I mean, the thing wow. weighs probably 50 to 60 pounds. I mean, it's like a, it's like a 30 to 40 kilo, or no, it's like, a, it's like a 25 to 30 kilo pound axe with a sledgehammer on one side of it. Um, I'm actually going back this weekend. Uh, I don't know when that will be for when this airs, but um, I loved it. Like, I, I was in the desert. I was getting out of L.A., getting out of myself. Um, you know, the world is in a state of tumult, not only everywhere, but even like my world, my personal world is in a massive state of tumult. And I found myself feeling sorry for myself or whinging about things or, or feeling helpless or whatever. And I thought, you know what? I can't do anything for myself right now. But maybe I can do something to help a friend of mine. Oh, I like it. Okay, you have another sip. <laughs> Sorry. I was just taking a, just a quick moment there. By the way, mine turned out delightfully. I don't mine, know how yours turned out. Mine is um, really good, actually, yeah. You need a garnish. You need, you need like an olive or something. Oh, you know, I, 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 I do have olives. I have olives. I can garnish. Oh, I can garnish. Okay. I'm garnishing right now. Get you one of these, like, little, get you a little toothpick thing. Like and a toothpick. throw it's some fine. olives on there. I've garnished. There you go. And you can even put, if you want to go just a little dirty, just a little splash of the olive juice. Nice, nice. Um, listen, back on track. Um, Sorry, um, you, but you, but yeah. you. I mean, you had a tough pandemic in so much as just your mental health. It was, it was tough. On it's been tough for many people. It uh, still is tough as we enter into this new. We have tiers here in London, which is kind of tier one, tier two, three, tier three kind of situation. But mm -hmm. how was your own mental health throughout the initial lockdown? You had a tough time in isolation. I think, like everyone else on the planet. I felt like the rug was ripped from under my feet. Um, and I felt like I could feel it happening slow motion. Like the rug was just being ripped from my feet and I was falling face first and I was gonna smash my face on the ground. Um, I felt like I was in a state of like free fall almost. Like it was just, um, 
it was really difficult. And, you know, I mean, look, I, I know there are people who had it way harder than I did. Um, but, you know, it's all subjective. You, you can only deal with your own reality. Um, and mine was, <laughs> it felt like it was falling apart. Um, and that's a really kind of scary place. Like, but at the same time, it's a place of change. And change is the only universal constant. Change and chaos are the only things happening every single place that we happen to look in the known observable universe. It's, 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 that's the only thing that is a constant. Um, and it's scary, change is scary. But at the same time, change always precipitates growth. And um, it was a time to grow. Well, I feel like I really had a choice of making it a time to grow or a time to just implode. And I, and I, without paying attention, I had started down the path of just like completely imploding and, and, and letting my, my sort of mental health lapse and, and allowing myself to end up in positions or situations that I knew were detrimental for me. Um, but you know what? I had a wake up call one day. I had a very intense wake up call one day and I realized that I needed more help than I realized. Uh, so I called a friend of mine, um, Brendan, who works in mental health. And I was like, dude, it's, it's, it's not good. It's not good for me. And he goes, I know it's not good for anyone. And I go, yeah, but it's, it's, it's really not good for me. Like I'm, I'm, I'm having a really hard time. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to this is. And he ended up getting me on the phone with a therapist who, uh, I started working with multiple times a week just to get me through sort of like the crisis aspect of what was going on. Um, I still work with her once a week at least and uh you know i mean i think that this has been a very interesting time where when we stripped away everything that society said oh you can distract yourself with going out to dinner you can distract yourself with nightclubs you can distract yourself with pubs you can distract yourself with whatever when that was stripped away we were stuck dealing with ourselves and i think a lot of people realized that they didn't like what themselves looked like they didn't like where they'd gotten to and i was i was in that position as well um, and I decided to just take whatever steps I could to, to make a difference and to, to help myself because like, I can't be the best father that I can be if I'm not the best version of myself. I can't be the best friend. I can't be the best actor. I, I can't be any of that if I'm not actually a good, healthy, functioning version of myself. And having the time to sit with myself in quarantine made it painfully clear that I've got some improvement to do, and that's, that's the goal, that's the journey. I don't think I'll ever get there. I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I say, I've nailed it, this is it, I'm happy, like this is great. Um, I just don't know that that's necessarily in my personality, but at the same time, I love the idea of struggling to get that a little bit more every day. That is, I mean, that's, that's a pretty, it's, it's a, pretty, well, a pretty brave thing to say, to be able to, to sit in front of yourself, a reflection of yourself. Yeah, but why, but why? Well, well, not, but no. why, like, here's the thing, like, why is it brave to say that you need help? Like, why is no, it brave okay. to say that your brain... Sorry, go on. Go no, ahead, no, you know. no, you're, you're right. And, and, it, and I was going to ask you why... By is the way, it, as you can tell, I'm doing totally fine on this. <laughs> why is it, I guess, you know, you're right. It shouldn't be thought of as brave for men to ask for help. Um, I totally agree with you about that. But to strip, uh, you know, yourself completely to the bare bones and look at yourself and say, I am not happy with what is standing in front of me. That, you know, that's a yeah. hard thing to do. And I guess it's when you're, you know, you're, you're on pretty much like, you know, the bottom when you do that. And, and, and I just wondered what that felt like for you at that moment. It must've been pretty stark. I think in that moment, it felt... Wow. Um... There was one specific moment where I was not in my best mental state and I was not in my healthiest place. And um, in the midst of this moment that was very intense, I had, a, I had a very intense moment of clarity where I sat my head up and I thought, I'm not okay. Like this isn't, this isn't how this should go. These aren't the thoughts I should be having in my head. This isn't what I should be doing. This isn't me being the best father. This isn't me being the best person, human, partner, whatever. Um, and it's really sobering when you have that moment because, because what happens, or I'm sorry, not to say what happens, but like just to make it about me, what happened with me is you start getting caught in these thoughts 
and they and they spiral. And you know whether they are, you know, intrusive negative thoughts or whether they are fatalistic thoughts or whatever they might be for you subjectively. I was in this downward spiral of these thoughts, and it was just taking me lower and lower and lower. And and because like, I love to work more than anything other than my children. Like I love to work and I love to be productive and I love to feel like I'm actually doing something. So when I don't have that to do, it kind of sends me for a little bit of a loop. Um, but when you have that moment of boom, and it's almost like you get removed from yourself and you see how unhealthily your brain has been treating you. Cause it's like, you're, you're the only one who can control your thoughts. You're the only one who can control your attitudes. Things happen around you, not to you. Nothing is good or bad, only thinking that makes it so, right? And when you get out of yourself and you are removed from that and you look at yourself and you go, that's not good. It's in a really sobering thought and it can do two things, I think. It could have either sent me spiraling farther going, look at this place I've gotten to. Oh, this is the worst. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Or, and in my case, what it led me to do is go, I don't want this for myself. I don't want to be this version of myself. I want to be a better version of myself. I want to be the best version of myself for myself, for my kids, for everyone around me. Because the, the way it was going, I was just becoming more and more dark and toxic. And that's not an, that's not an influence that anyone really wants on their life. I think, you know, it's so important um, that... Uh, well, people in the public eye, you know, traditionally, you know, movie stars, actors, you know, people, uh, you know, who you think have and do have to a certain extent, very privileged lives, uh, go on record and say, look, it's not, you know, we struggle too. what you see on Instagram, what you see in the movies, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a mirage, it's, a, it's, it's cinematic. By the way, it's the same thing that what you see in the movies. You see actors in the movies and you go, oh my God, they look so glamorous. Look at their clothes, look at, oh, look at all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, well that person showed up an hour and a half early for work and went through full hair and makeup and then put on clothes that someone picked for them <laughs> specifically. That's not that person's life. They're doing a job. Like, you know, I yeah. get it, I get it. And by, and by the way, like, it, it also, I'm, I'm self-aware enough to know that like an actor who's done well for himself and blah, 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 like, oh, him complaining about his life? Well, fuck that guy. It's like, yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I get that you, you have a right to that opinion. But at the same time, like when you complain about your life, you're right. And when that person complains about their life, they're right. And when that person complains about their life, they're right. You don't get to gatekeep people's suffering. Everyone suffers in different ways. And that's okay. It's, it's, suffering is not the bad thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone will suffer. That is basically a tenet of every major religion ever. Life is suffering. Life is hard. People's suffering look differently, but that doesn't negate their own suffering or how it feels to them. You were, you know, uh, we've, we've chatted about this a bit, but just to reiterate how important it was for you to recognize that in yourself. And then uh, quite shortly after that, I believe you played it forward. You, you had, a, you spoke to a friend of yours who uh, who was in trouble, he thought, not just in trouble, but, but dire straits, you know, suicidal, in fact. Yeah. Um, and you pulled yeah. him back from the brink, pretty much, right? I mean, look, I, I, I don't think I pulled him back from the brink. I think, I think what happened was, is I called a guy I knew, and he, he did the brave thing of <clears> telling <throat> me that he was hurting. And I was like, what's going on, man? And I just asked him questions, like, from a genuine perspective of, like, I'm curious if you're okay. And the more he said, the more I realized that he was not okay. Um, he was really not okay. Like he said, he'd spent the whole morning thinking about killing himself. Um, uh, he, did, he didn't. He um, did And I was able to talk to him and we had a really good chat. And I was like, look, dude, I, I, I get what you're going through. I, I mm. get it on a deep level, but let me tell you, like, it's not gonna fix anything. Mm. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's a very short term answer for, you know, what could be a long term solution. I think that that's not special on my part. Like, I, I, I think that that's what friends are for. Like, and, and if we don't think that that's what friends are for, then why do we even have friends? Yeah. You know, it, it, a test of a friendship is not how close of friends you are when things are going really well. Like, of course it's going really well. If I'm in a really good mood and I'm having a really good time, everyone around me is my friend. 
no question. Like, you're all my friends. I love you all. <laughs> but as soon as I'm hurting, and as soon as I'm locked in my bedroom, and I you know, can't get out of bed for a couple of days, or I can't stop crying, and one of my friends shows up and grabs me and goes, let's go. We're going for a hike. Let's go. We're getting you out of your house. Let's go. We're going to the beach. We're going to go swim in the ocean. Let's go. You know what? We're going to go do this. We're going to go fucking... We're going to go to one of those rooms where you smash shit with a baseball bat. Like, whatever it is. Like, th those are your friends. That's what friends are actually for. Everyone else around you are just acquaintances. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, and testament to you, to, to, to you uh, putting your head above the parapet and talking about that and talking about helping your friend. You know, it's the sort of thing, if people see it, then... It can only encourage people to talk more. When, when we spoke a few weeks ago, it may have been, time is now so fluid, it may have been like six months ago, I can't really remember. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. You uh, described America as, uh, as a dumpster fire. You know, it was in a bad place. Yep. We're, we've moved on a little bit. A dumpster fire fueled by napalm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know. gave Biden and Kamala Harris only, f you said you were being optimistic about this, a 50-50% chance. Now this, uh, I, I will go out uh, the week before the election. Have you changed your view at all, Army? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what my view is. I know, unfortunately, that karmically speaking, you get the leader that you deserve. And in the state that America is in, I don't know that we actually deserve better than Donald Trump. I hope we get it. I hope we can be better. I mean, I also am not delusional about the fact that Biden coming in to the office of the United States president is not going to fix all of our problems uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there's a reason we have a two-party system and there's a reason they get to pick who we vote for because the status quo will continue. The show must go on. Like the way American politics are set up, it's not so anyone can actually come in and cause an upheaval because a president might only get four years, maybe eight. But in eight years on the long enough timeline, that's nothing. So if a president comes in and completely upheaves everything for eight years, the next president is going to come in and upheave what that president did. And then you end up in a vicious cycle where no one's making progress. They're just undoing what the other did, which is exactly why we are given the candidate choices that we are, because this is about something much bigger than the temporary office of the United States president. I'm sure when the president gets into office, they go, you had all these grand ideas, you had all these plans, let me tell you what's really going on, this is what you're going to do. And someone, probably Mitch McConnell, the most powerful man in America, weirdly enough, is going to go, this is what you're going to do. Uh, so I don't have faith in politics. I don't have faith in politicians. I don't think that they're going to fix our troubles. I think community will. I think people banding together. I think, I think people showing that we don't actually need the government we need ourselves. We need to be the best versions of ourselves because they're politicians. They're trained liars. And anyone who decides to be a politician in high school should be banned from going into politics. <laughs> These guys aren't actually invested in the well-being of their constituency. They're interested in power. So fuck those guys. You were saying before that, um, you know, as an actor, you can spot really bad acting. Uh, and that's, yeah. that's why you find it kind of frustrating, but you're able to dig out these politicians for their, you know... Uh, in, in sincerity. They're all shitty actors. They're all the worst. I mean, they look at you and they go, you know, I was talking to this woman in a town hall, and then all of a sudden the eyebrow starts going, and they go, she <laughs> said to me, Joe, I need you to make America great again. And I looked her in the eye, and I said, Susie. And you're just like, this is like the worst monologue I've ever seen in my life. Like, <laughs> change the channel. This is the only channel? How is this the only channel? Like, it's, it's the worst. Army, we're nearly out of time. I could stay here all night and pour myself another drink. I, I, I've, and I will, in we've fact. Do, we've done that before. <laughs> and we will again, uh, my friend. Last question, uh, which I wanted to raise yep. with you on a personal level. Uh, you've taken up golf. Why? Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I actually have a good reason. I've just become obsessed with it. And I used to be the guy who was always like, you play golf? <laughs> Boring. I'm still that guy. done base jumping? <laughs> and now I'm getting older, and I'm like, fuck, I love golf. Like, golf is <laughs> a, like, 
Also, you know what golf is? Golf is a four-hour excuse to go out with a couple of buddies and walk on grass and leave your phone behind and just hit some balls and then have fun and like play a sport and get outside. Like I, I, I love golf. I'm obsessed. Well, let's uh, maybe we'll have a uh, round. By the way, th uh, let me be very clear. I'm still terrible <laughs> at golf, but I love it nonetheless. That's good. Um, Army, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for sparing, um, giving us the time again and being part of, of our virtual festival round, which will be reinstated as a physical, living, breathing thing, I'm sure, next year. Uh, and then you must come and then we will, well, that's another story, I guess. But thank you for your time. You're a superstar. Can we still drink martinis? We can. Cheers to you. Mm. Cheers to you. See you later, my man. <laughs> See ya.